1 Samuel chapter 15. First and second Samuel, first and second King, first and second Chronicles. First Samuel fifteen, and then last is Psalm ninety-five. <coughs> Hebrews seven, first Corinthians eleven, first Samuel fifteen, and then last Psalm ninety-five. And when you get to Psalm ninety-five, please stand with me. And I want to read to you the first seven verses in preparation for worship this morning. And don't forget to please remain standing as they lead us in song. Psalm 95 verse 1. The psalmist writes, O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. We are continuing to walk through the subject of worship, uh, sermon number three here, and I believe unless the Lord changes my heart, we will finish that next week which is good. We will be gone two weeks from today. Uh, Michaela McDougall's getting married, so we will be out of pocket that particular weekend. And that will give us a weekend perhaps to continue processing these things. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm gonna get Sarah to do this when she gets back, to put a box somewhere, probably on the table in the foyer for questions. Hopefully much of what I said has caused questions to pop up in your mind. And I know you guys are pretty shy about asking questions unless you're part of the Wednesday night crowd. So I'm going to give you just the opportunity to write the questions down, slide them in a box. And if there's sufficient questions, then I'll deal with them the Sunday that I get back. But continue to pray as the elders and I and, and just continue to process this and walk through these things, considering worship. We certainly want to be faithful in all things. And so we have much to consider, much to pray about. But be heading to Hebrews chapter 7 for me. I'll start there, then we'll run right back to Psalms. Uh, Psalm 95, so don't get, you know, leave your mark there in Psalm. We're going to be in Psalm a lot this morning. We have a lot to look about, look at, but I don't, I don't, the subject is just primarily one thing, but yet there's a lot of passages that I do want us to consider. And like I said last week, let me clarify what we're talking about. We're talking about the corporate gathering of God's people for the purpose of worship. We're not talking about your personal time in worship, but like I said last week, what we do corporately should serve as a precursor and a pattern for what you do personally. But worship is a word that we use very flippantly. In fact, uh, there's a, I don't know, I guess a concert that's taking place. If I have time that I'll mention in my notes, uh, it's at a very, well, I won't even say unfaithful. It's at a church that preaches a false gospel uh, that many people that we might recognize and even appreciate will be participating in what they're calling a worship service that's going to take place in October. So you'll have to wrestle with that in your own mind. Uh, can you worship at a church that preaches a false gospel? Uh, I, would, I would be inclined to say not at all. So we've got to consider these things since everybody throws this word around. I want to be very careful to help you understand what I'm talking about is what we do now as a corporate congregation, the children of God. Now, where we finished up last week, or at least near the finish, is one of the most important things that we have to consider when we talk about the issue of worship. And that is how the gospel changed everything about worship. When you study the Old Testament, you have to remember that those were the foundations that were poured. But once we, when we walk into the time where Christ came, He lived before us, He died for us, he was raised and he was seated at the right hand of the Father. 
Everything about worship changed from that point forward. And so you have to look at that, pray through that, understand that and consider that before you move forward in the forms that worship takes place in the church today. One of the most significant things or things that change you find in Hebrews chapter seven, verse 23. The priesthood, if you will, the chief priest, the mediator was forever changed when the Lord came. Verse 23 says the former priests on the one hand existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. And so right off the bat, you pick up one of the problems with the priesthood in the Old Testament. Number one, they had to be replaced because they died. And if you think about the significance of someone serving as your mediator between you and God, you can see how that's a real problem. Because in the Old Testament, you needed a go between, if you will, what is a mediator to stand in between you, a holy God and a sinful people. And if that guy checked out, you lost your mediator and he had to be replaced. So that's a very serious issue. The second, even more serious issue is not only did the Old Testament mediator had to mediate for you, he had to mediate for himself, meaning not only did he offer sacrifices for the congregation, but he had to offer sacrifices for himself because he too was a sinner. That's a big problem. That's an insufficient mediator because he's a sinner just like me. And so you pick up in verse 24 and it says, but Jesus, because he has fixed both, fixed both of these problems, it says, but Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. And he gives us the reasons of verse 25 of why that's so awesome. Therefore, first reason, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him. Now, in other words, your salvation is eternal because your priest is eternal and he is seated at the right hand of the Father as your mediator. You need to be very thankful for that because your salvation doesn't go anywhere. It rests solely in your priest, your mediator, and it doesn't rest in you. If your salvation rested in you, you would lose it before the day was done. And you would have to go about the business of regaining that salvation very quickly in case you died through the night in your sleep. But we don't have that problem because it doesn't rest on us. Our salvation rests on our priest. Our priest has been raised from the dead. We'll die no more. And so our salvation rests securely no matter where we are or what we're doing. The second reason is even more significant for us this morning. Notice what it says in the second half of verse 25. Since he always lives, present tense, to make intercession, present tense, for them. In other words, Christ, even now, intercedes for you. Even as we gather before the Father in worship, the Lord Jesus is making intercession for you that your worship might be received. And so that draws comfort as I consider this aspect of worship and perhaps the forms that we need to, to do in order to be faithful, even if we get it wrong. We have a priest that's interceding on our behalf. Even if in the moments of repentance that you forgot something that is huge, we can rest safely and securely in the worship of God because we have a priest who intercedes for us even now. And without that, we would be doomed. And our worship would not be received. But now we have a priest seated at the right hand of the Father who continually intercedes on our behalf. Even through the night, He intercedes for us. Our first moment where we draw that breath and our eyes pop open, He is interceding for us. On your drive to church while you were fussing with the kids, or maybe your spouse, He was interceding for you. And as I speak now, as a fallen and sinful man, solely trusting in the grace of God, He is interceding on my behalf. So we draw near to God with thankful hearts, but with confident hearts, knowing that it has all been made well for us through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's one huge thing that's radically changed as we move out of the old into the new. And another one very significant change is the sacrifices. There are no more. Christ was not only the priest, but he was also the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It was one sacrifice for all sins for all time that was paid on your behalf. 
And so if you're trusting in that sacrifice, it's done. You don't need the altar because you don't need a lamb. You don't need a ram. You don't need a, a, a calf or anything like that to offer to the Father because the, the Father provided the sacrifice Himself and it was sufficient. And it paid for your sins in the past and it pays for your sins in the present and it will pay for your sins in the future. One sacrifice for all time. But here's the thing that should cause your heart to tremble. If you're not in Christ this morning, there still is a sacrifice to be paid and you will pay that. It is either going to be your blood for all of eternity that's poured out as the wrath of God consumes or it was His sacrifice and His blood that has atoned for all of your sins. Judgment will fall on you or judgment has fallen on him in your behalf. And so there's a thing in that when we consider the sacrifice for all time that is caused for either great, great celebration or absolute fear that you should be lying under your pew right now crying out to God. That's how fearful of a thing that is. You're trusting in him or you're trusting in yourself. That changed. Something else that changed is worship is no longer in a temple, but now worship takes place in Christ. Thankful for the building, but I have to constantly remind you it's nothing. Whether it's a building or a temple or a campus, whether it looks like a chicken house or a cathedral, it's absolutely insignificant because the temple has been replaced and we worship in Him. In Christ. Remember, he said, you tear down this temple and I'll build it again in three days. And so all worship takes place in Christ and not in a particular place. Which is great for us because someday soon they're going to lock that door. And the worship, the faithful worship of God will take place in this building no more. And I can't imagine that it would be much longer than it has been already. I can't imagine that that's not coming soon. But that's not going to stop our worship. Because we'll either worship in my basement, and I'll have to build a bigger basement, or we'll worship in the woods down at the creek behind my house. It will not stop our worship. We will die before they take away our worship, but we can worship anywhere at any time because we worship in Him, in Christ. And we always have to remember that. We as the children of God will never stop the worship of God. And we don't have to because it's not tied to a place. And then the last thing that I want to mention is found in Hebrews chapter 10. So go with me there this morning. And I want you to see something else that's changed. And this is where we'll camp out for the majority of our time this morning. Hebrews chapter 10, notice verse 14. For by one offering, He, Christ, has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. In other words, one of the most significant changes that has taken place coming out of the old and into the new happened to you and happened to me. Now we are fit for the worship of God. Radically fit. Paul uses the word perfected. You've been made perfect for the worship of of God. And that all was accomplished through the sacrifice of Christ. Now, as you pray about worship and consider worship, that's one of the passages. In fact, the whole book of Hebrews is one of the books. But at least that verse 10, 14 is one that you've got to highlight. You've got to circle and you've got to consider as we pray about worship. We have been perfected by the work of Christ, by the blood of Christ for the purpose of worship. That's why when he gets down in verse 19, he draws everything to a conclusion. Therefore, notice what he says. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence now to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, and by no other way, I would add, it's a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, notice what we can do now in verse 22. Let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil inward man or an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 
therefore, we can draw into the Holy of Holies, if you will, into the personal presence of God and worship Him in absolute confidence, not because of anything we've done, but solely based on what Christ has done on our behalf. Now we can worship God wholeheartedly from the inside out, if you will. Now, I want to move on from there. The sacrifices have changed, but I'll come back to that this morning. But I do want us, again, I want us to stay on the idea that the worshipers have been changed through the work of Christ. And I want to start from the outside in. So we're going to move from the least significant to the most significant thing as we consider our worship or gathering for the worship of God corporately. And so the first thing that I want to talk about is, is what sort of physical posture is appropriate. Now, I'm absolutely committed to talking about every elephant in the room. So I hope your questions will be geared toward the elephants that I haven't dealt with. But let's just talk about this business of the lifting of the hands. OK. Now, first, to consider this, I want us to turn back to Psalm 95. And I want to look at a particular passage there in which the psalmist is instructing the corporate worship of the people of God. Psalms 95, verse 6. There's three words there in the Hebrew, shakah, karah, and barak. And they're all three in succession. I mean, there's one verb, come, let us, boom, boom, boom in the Hebrew. And it's translated in the English, worship, bow down, kneel. And then it goes on in the Hebrew, before the Lord our maker. So literally, come, let us, worship, bow down, kneel, before the Lord our Maker. And if you remember last week, I talked about the, the word shakha, which we translate worship, which literally is translated bow down. So he uses two different words to get the idea of bow down. He says bow down, bow down, kneel. Now it's easy for us to understand the picture that we're, we're presenting as we come before the Lord in worship, as we fall down before the Lord. Because it's a demonstration of our submission and our humility to the God that we worship and serve. And this is one of the ways that they express this in the Old Testament. And I wonder how comfortable you would be doing that this morning. If I had instructed you to get up out of your seats and get on your knees in your pew and let us come before the Lord in humility and submission to worship Him. There are some churches that do that. In fact, Audrey and Jonathan actually went to a particular church. I think it was a Presbyterian church, wasn't it, Jonathan? It was, uh, CTK. it was CTK. They actually got out of their seats, got on their knees, and wasn't the ground made out of brick? Yeah. And got on their knees and confessed their sins before they drew near to the Lord in worship. I mean, that's consistent with the teaching of Scripture. I don't know how comfortable you would be if you visited a church and they told you to get up out of your seats and get on your knees as we come before the Lord. But you do understand that was a part of their worship when they drew near to God, whether that was personally or corporately. And I think you understand that from a personal perspective, because I bet many of you, when you gather before the Lord in prayer and to spend time in his word, you probably find yourself on your knees. I bet most of you do. But they didn't just do that corporately. I mean, they didn't just do that personally. They did that corporately as well to present themselves as submitted and humble before the God that they worship and serve. Now, there's some other physical aspects or postures that are taken uh, in the Old Testament. You don't have to follow me there. It's 2 Chronicles chapter 6, if you're taking notes. Solomon is dedicating the temple and he actually goes through a number of physical things. And the reason that I mention them is because Scripture mentions them. For instance, in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 12, it says, Then Solomon stood before the altar in the presence of the assembly of Israel. So Solomon walks out and Scripture wants you to note that he's standing in worship before the people of God. And we do that sometimes. And then it says Solomon spread out his hands toward the Lord as he began to pray. And sometime along through that prayer, he actually falls down on his knees. And you can imagine the king doing this before the people. The king actually falls down on his knees with his hands continuing to be extended toward the heavens as he prays that prayer of dedication. It was an awesome moment. The whole congregation was engaged in worship. And you see Solomon the king doing a number of things from standing to getting on his knees and the whole time with his hands lifted toward the heavens in prayer to the Father. Okay? Now, one of the most 
significant things is found in Psalm 63. So you're in 95, back up to 63. And this is where hands are brought up again. Now, it's fascinating when you begin to study the lifting of the hands and those sort of things, especially in the psalmist as the worship leader leads the congregation. You find them worshiping for God's right hand a whole lot more than your hands are ever mentioned. Now, if you understand what God's right hand represents, that's his hand of deliverance. That's his hand of power and strength. It is depicted as his right hand with which he saved us. And so the psalmist often worships the father for the power demonstrated in the right hand of the father. But there are times in which our hands are mentioned. One time it's mentioned in a negative context. It's not a good thing. Well, actually more than one time. One time it's mentioned in this way. Never would I lift my hands toward a foreign or a false little G God. But then you have a few times that it's mentioned in a positive context in the worship of the congregation. So notice Psalm 63 verse 1. Oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live and I will lift up my hands in your name. There you go. My soul is satisfied with marrow and fatness and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. And so here it's in the context of honoring the Lord. The lifting of the hands and the, is, is honoring to the Lord. At other times, and I could have, again, I could have put down four or five here, but I didn't think there was a need. The lifting of the hands is an expression of need. God, I need you. And so I'm lifting my hands in order to receive you. It's just an expression of where the heart's at. Now, that begs the question, Pastor, why don't you? I do. But I'm almost always alone. And it's in those moments when I'm just absolutely broken or absolutely overwhelmed at the gospel. And I find myself in that moment doing those sort of things. You're like, well, why don't you ever do it in worship? I don't usually do it in corporate worship because of what it's become. For instance, while we were at the youth thing just a few weeks ago, I told you every hand in the room that I could see was lifted toward the Father except 10 of us because we were singing a song that's completely contrary to the teaching of the gospel. I can't lift my hands to that. The first song that we sang, we sang, uh, it was about how loud we were about to get. I can't lift my hands to that. The second song that we sang was about how awesome my worship was about to be. Not the worship of God, but how awesome my worship was about to be. I can't lift my hands to that. And then the third song, every night in the three succession, was contrary because I'm not even fit for worship. Well, that's a complete rejection of what Christ has done in Hebrews 10, 14. I'm not lifting my hands to that. I find it fascinating that this has become the measure of a person's holiness rather than his heart. This is it rather than your character. This is it rather than your holiness. And so when all those reasons begin to stack up in my heart and I understand what's going on in corporately, I usually don't. Because I want to make a distinction. And we'll see some other reasons in regard to personal sin in, in just a moment. But there's no, it's not a sin. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a good thing in the text. It expresses good things in the text. But there's reasons that I usually find myself not doing it for a whole lot of reasons. <laughs> And one of the reasons is that it's absolutely frustrating that I usually reserve it for personal time is because there are people watching you who are going to do what you do. And I don't want them to do that in worship. I want their minds to be fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ and not me. And so I don't want to do anything to cause distraction or to lead you in something you don't even understand. Because worship... Once you find yourself in the personal presence of God, I think we all know that we do things in those moments that we don't do corporately. 
that are very personal. We find ourselves at times, I bet many of you have screamed aloud in your personal time with the Lord. I bet other times you've just danced. I bet other times you've just taken off running. I've done that. Just so full that I just had to run. Am I going to do that in here? No. Absolutely not. This is the corporate body. I will not steal the attention away from God for any reason whatsoever. And we've talked about this from the, from the perspective of those who lead in song and music. And I'm so thankful for the people who get up here. They had rather be in the back room, each and every one of them, than here on the stage. Because they don't want you to see them. They want your eyes fixed on the Father. And I'm so thankful that we have people like that. That God has provided people like that. Worship is about God. It's not about us. And so sometimes you have to be intentional to keep it about him and not about you. So that's the lifting of hands. But let's move into something much more important. And that is the posture of your heart as you draw near to God. This for sure really matters. Now, there are some things that absolutely dictate and determine our hearts as a whole when we meet in here to worship God. Sometimes some of you have had babies and my heart and I know many of your hearts is just absolutely filled with joy. You're going to have a tough time getting me to be somber and serious when one of y'all have had a baby because I'm just praising the Lord that God has added to our number in this church because that's about the only way he does. The second reason is that my heart is absolutely filled with joy is when one of your kids comes to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and we baptize them. I can't be somber or serious. I'm just excited. I'm just absolutely filled with joy and that's going to spill over into our attitude. But sometimes there are things that happen that would send us right the other way that we just couldn't recover from. I think most of you realized if the Lord had not been gracious Tuesday, our worship here as a body would have been radically affected for a number of weeks to come. If the Lord hadn't spared Lexi Tuesday, we would be crying right now, praying, crying, praying, crying, praying, and going home. That's all I could have done. I wouldn't have known how to lead you any differently. And when I think about Virginia's brother, the Lord didn't spare his son and his two small girls Thursday a week ago. And so I can't imagine that congregation as they met last Sunday having lost a dad that it was early 40s and two small teenage girls and then you got to meet for worship. You see, that's going to change worship. And the only thing that you could do is just sit and cry and beg God to help you and help the family, right? So without question, sometimes we draw near when the sovereignty of God has just taken over and He's going to lead us in great joy or He's going to lead us in terrible sadness. But for the most part, and this is what I want to focus on now, for the most part, the thing that we should draw near to God as a general rule is with a reverent, God-fearing heart. And I bring this up first because this has totally been lost. I can reflect back on almost every church that we've been a part of and they tried to establish the tone. And me and Holly were talking about this during VBS. They try to raise the bar high and you're super excited and clapping and waving and so excited. And then they bring you all the way down right before the preacher goes to you. You can just barely do anything to hold your tears back because they brought you to the mountain. Right. And then he preaches the word. That's the typical church that we've been a part of. And so what's completely been lost is the idea that we should approach God reverently and fearfully and respectfully and seriously. There's a whole lot of passages that I could use to help you understand this. One of those is in Psalms, uh, Psalms 2 verse 11 where the psalmist writes there, Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. That's hard to get a grasp of. How am I supposed to rejoice and tremble at the same time? Well, it's pretty easy to figure out when you recall the holiness of God. And when you recall who He is, then all of a sudden, you're reverent of heart. Now, I know you guys watch Netflix movies probably all the time, and hopefully you check them before you watch them. 
But there is one phrase that I find often repeated on a number of movies that should be an absolute red flag, and it's the word irreverent. Have you all seen that? Looking at Netflix, okay, we're going to watch this, and they'll give you three words to help describe the movie, and one of those words is irreverent. Why would I even want to watch that? And yet we gather for worship, and we're not even thinking about reverence. We're not even thinking about holiness. We're not even thinking about the reality that we're supposed to fear this God that we worship. Psalms 22, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him, stand in awe of him. All you descendants of Israel, from you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. Many, if anybody on the planet fears God, it ought to be us. And we ought to be able to communicate that fear to the Lord by being reverent of heart when we draw near to worship the Lord and not silly of heart. Psalm 96, verse 7. Listen to this worship. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory of His name, bring an offering, come into His courts, worship the Lord in holy attire, Tremble before Him, all the earth. Now see, He's even leading us into the presence of God to begin worship. And the worship leader says there, Tremble as you come. Bring your offering trembling as you come. Now the Lord made me tremble last night. Oh my goodness. I was absolutely just gripped with fear. Because I was reminded of the weight that I'm doing now. I'm leading y'all somewhere. And God forbid I lead us in the wrong direction. We're talking about worship. And I'm trying to get you to consider worship from the Scriptures. And what if I get it wrong? And I sat in the chair trembling last night and immediately got up and I got on my knees and I cried. I even kicked my shoes off. I was scared to death. And I began to plead with God, just do something before you let me lead them astray. And I felt the weight. And surely when we draw into the presence of God corporately, I want you to feel the weight of that moment. And realize that He's a holy God and we're not apart from Christ. I mean, we'll get to the part where we recall the, what God has done for us through the gospel and we'll turn our somber and our seriousness into gladness and joy. And I'm about to do that in the text through the psalmist. But nonetheless, there ought to be a part where we feel the weight of what we're about to do because nobody else can do that. You can't go out there and grab some old guy off the street and drag him in here and set him down and say, all right, we're going to worship God now. It's not going to happen for him. It's not going to be received by him because it only comes in Christ. He can't find the temple. But you and I have found the temple because we're in Christ. Therefore, we're the only ones who are saved that can draw near to God. Surely we can understand the weight of the death of the Son in order for us to worship the Father. It's heavy. The God that we worship, and I jotted this down in my notes, the God that we worship has not changed. The gospel didn't change Him. The gospel changed us. And listen to one of these moments in 2 Samuel chapter 6. You're familiar with this. David is attempting to move the ark of God, except he did it wrong. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it or stumbled. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, or, yeah, Uzzah and God struck him down there for his irreverence. And he died there by the ark of God. We worship that God. He literally reached out his hand because the oxen stumbled and he was afraid that the ark was going to fall. And he reached it out to steady the ark and God considered it so irreverent that he struck him dead where he stood. And we've forgotten how to tremble before this God. That's absolutely horrifying. Jonathan Edwards forever provides the best commentary to this particular moment. And he said, Uzzah presumed that his hands were cleaner than the dirt. Let 
We've forgotten that. Dirt is better than the sinner. And the only way that we could reach our hands out and touch the holiness of God is if we are in Christ. Apart from that, God considers that worship absolutely irreverent. And so when we come into the presence of God, you come by the blood of Christ or you don't come at all. And it would be an absolutely horrifying and terrifying thing to draw near to God without the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you might consider your own sinfulness, you would certainly come before the Lord trembling. If you thought about your broken relationships or the broken relationship that you have between brothers and sisters in Christ, you might come in here trembling. If you gave thought to the godlessness and the worldliness that has become a part of the church today, you would certainly come before the Lord trembling. You know, we've forgotten this, and if you read church history, you understand this. That's how genuine revival has always begun. The people are filled with fear over their own personal sin, and they come trembling, confessing their sins. That's how every genuine revival has ever started. Could we not do a better job when we draw into the presence of God, trembling and fearful of the God that we worship? To give you a New Testament example of this, and I touched on this last week, but I want us to set our eyes on it. So go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11. Now, I want you to notice verse 18 because that sets the context for what Paul is talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, notice verse 18. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, you see that? All right, he's going to talk about worship without question. Now, notice what's going on. I hear that divisions exist among you. So Paul shoots straight to hit the bullseye at the problem that's going on when they gather for worship. The church is divided. And we know from chapter 1 that it was divided over a number of things. Alright, notice verse 23, because he's going to bring up the context of the Lord's Supper. And then real quickly, if you'll notice at verse 33, at the end of his conversation, he'll say in verse 33, So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. All right, so he's not going to leave this subject of these divisions that's going on with the body. But right in the middle of it, he wants to talk about the Lord's Supper. So there's something very important that's concerned Paul because there's divisions of the church, yet you continue to gather at the table. Now watch this in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, here we go. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment on himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, verse 30, many among you are weak and sick, and a number have died or fallen asleep, he says. And that don't mean you've fallen asleep during the sermon. It means that you have died. In other words, the God that we worship hasn't changed. Now, what in the world, the most important phrase of the whole passage, does an unworthy manner mean? Well, that's been debated since it was written down what that could possibly mean. Some people said they were doing this wrong. There was a particular method in which the Lord wanted it to be done, but they were doing it wrong. I don't think it means that. Typically, the church today takes an unworthy manner as to mean personal sin. Personal sin. 
And I'm okay with that, but I still don't think that's specifically the issue. But certainly we give you a time of repentance before we draw near the table. I think if you keep it in the context, the unworthy manner is the division within the body. And you draw near to the Lord who has made you one and given himself for that very purpose. That's the context of the passages. So how awful is it is for us to draw near to the table when we're divided one from another? Whatever the unworthy manner is, it was so serious to the Lord that he put a number of them to death. Paul said, that's why many of you have fallen asleep. For the roses of the rest of you, it's many while you're weak or many while you're sick. Can we not come before this Lord trembling? There's things that we desperately need to take seriously. You know, the problem with Corinth is the problem with the church today. If you'll notice in verse 16, this is the heart of the problem at Corinth. And I don't know why they named this Corinth, but that's the name of our church. I certainly hope verse 16 is not consistent with who we are. But notice verse 16. If one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice nor have the churches of God. Now he's talking about a different issue there that we'll talk about when we go through 1 Corinthians. But this was the problem at Corinth. They did what they wanted to do. And Paul tells them there, listen, there's no other practice or no other churches that are doing it the way that you're doing it. You're just doing this. And you're contentious about it. And that's pretty much describes the American church. Everybody's doing what they see fit and no one's submitting themselves to the authority of Scripture. That's why homosexuality is being accepted in some churches. That's why homosexuals are preaching from the pulpit. They're being contentious. They don't care about what the Word says. They'll do what they want to do. And see, I don't want us to be like that. I don't want us to be stubborn, stiff-necked, and contentious. I want us to be humble and allow the Word of God to direct us. Hopefully we'll be more like the Bereans and the Corinthians. If you remember in Acts 17, they were more noble-minded for they received the Word with great eagerness and they examined the Scriptures daily to see whether or not what Paul was saying was true. And I hope that you're doing that in regard to worship. But the last thing that I want to talk about before we turn the corner and get to joy, and then I don't have a whole lot after that, but I want you to go to Revelations chapter 1 because I'm still in this business of approaching the Lord with a reverent, serious, somber, trembling heart because I think it's consistent with the gospel. Revelation chapter 1. Let me ask you some questions before I direct you to the particular passage as you're making your way to Revelation. Who is the disciple that described himself the disciple whom Jesus loved? John. Who is the disciple who laid his head upon the Lord's breast? John. Who is, this one's really easy if you hadn't gotten one yet. Who is the disciple that wrote the gospel of John? John. Now, the reason I bring up the last one is the most important one. Because if John understood the gospel, he's a New Testament worshiper, right? I mean, he wrote a very awesome spirit-filled letter for us to help us better understand the gospel, okay? So how do you think John would approach the Lord? I mean, think about it. If John's the guy who even some of the other disciples recognize that that's the one Jesus loves. I'm thinking that the way John would approach the Lord in worship might be with a great deal of excitement. I could even picture John, since he was that kind of guy that would hold your hands and lay his head on the Lord's chest. I just picture him jumping into the Lord's arms, wrapping both legs and both arms around him and just doing something really weird because he just loved Jesus so much and he, just, he didn't bother him how he was going to express that at all, right? And if anybody understands New Testament gospel centered worship, let's just keep our eyes on John to see how we come into the presence of God. Yeah, is that a fair thought? Well, then read verse 17. Because verse 17 is a clear picture of what John did when John saw Jesus, right? When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. There's your disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, where's the clapping? Where's the fist pump? Where's the high five? Where's any of that? 
John saw the moment I saw him, my knees buckled and I fell down on my face. And he had to lift me up and tell me not to be afraid because I was absolutely gripped with fear. And yet, look how we come into the church today. What are we doing? Are we putting on a show? Are we entertaining the crowds? Are we trying to make it fun and exciting so the lost people might come back? Have you thought about this? And this actually happened to me one time. It was during one of those days where you invite a friend, and I invited a lost friend, and they came, and I asked them what they thought when it was over, which was a really dumb question, an immature question on my part, and their words to me were this, boy, that was entertaining. Now, I had no idea. I didn't even know how to read the Word of God. That was so long ago. But still, that was like a punch in the gut because I was like, wait a minute. If you found it entertaining, there has to be something wrong because you're not walking with Christ. But I think we're so pragmatic and so concerned with making the worship fun and exciting and filled with energy and somehow we go equals the Holy Spirit, which really gets me mad. But that's what we do. And we try to make it entertaining so people will come back and John's laying on his face like a dead man. You see, I think he understands worship far better than the church, the American church for sure, understands the worship of God. Trembling, repenting, we should come. But at the same time, now run with me to Psalms, the book of Psalms, and I'll point out a few Psalms to you. I tell you what, you stop off at the book of Matthew, and I'll, I'll catch up with you in just a second. You stop off at Matthew 15 to save us some time, and then we'll talk about the turn, okay? Because we're not just serious, we're not just somber, we're not just trembling. At the very same time, our joy is almost to the point that we cannot contain it, though we can. So let me read you some Psalms. Psalms 33, 3, the psalmist says, Sing to him a new song, play skillfully with a shout of joy. With an absolute shout of joy, worship the Lord. Psalms 95, let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. We're not just random shouting. We're shouting the psalms. That's interesting. Psalms 100, enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. 1 Chronicles 16, jot that one down. Read all of chapter 16 in your notes, but listen to what David says. Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord be glad. So in other words, there's times when there's worship service that we move from trembling to absolute gladness of heart. And of course, you know, the only way you can do that is with the understanding and the expression of the gospel. So in other words, liturgy is very useful in the fact that it helps us move from a trembling heart to a heart that's absolutely filled with joy and gladness. And I think the table is the best expression of that when we remember His broken body and His shed blood. When we get done with the table, there ought to be shouts of praise because God has delivered us. Now, the last thing about your heart, and this is the most important thing that I want to talk about right now, is with a humble and obedient heart. I've talked about a trembling heart. I've talked about a glad heart. But listen, you better be deeply concerned about the obedient heart. So notice with me in Matthew chapter 15, verse 3. Let's read a couple of passages in the Gospels. Matthew 15, verse 3. And Jesus answered and said to them, Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition. For God said, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to the Lord or to God. So he is not to honor his father or mother. And by this, you have invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Notice, you hypocrites. 
Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Verse 9, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. In other words, you want to make your worship absolutely vanity, insignificant, unacceptable? Just walk in here with unrepentant sin in your life. Open rebellion, going your way and not God's way, and you can make your worship vain. You have to realize that. The Lord's using the example of honor your father and mother, which he commanded clearly in the law. But they said, you know, there's, and, and by the way, honoring your father and mother in this context is you meeting their needs. Way to go, sis. You're doing a good job. That's honoring your father and mother. But the Bible says here that they said, oh, I've got something to do for the Lord. I don't have time. Sorry, mom and dad. Can't take care of you right now. Blessed be his name. And Jesus said, why are you doing that? Why are you breaking the command of God for something that you think is so good and holy? When you do that, you don't understand that you're making your worship of me vain. You lift your hands, which by the way is another reason I don't lift my hands. You lift your hands with sin in your life, singing out loud amazing grace, and all the while you've got open and unrepentant sin and rebellion in your life. God says, no thanks. Don't need that worship. You're wasting your time. Go with me to Mark chapter 7. He quotes the exact same verse for a different reason. Mark chapter 7 verse 1. Mark 7, beginning in verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of Jesus' disciples were eating their bread with the impure hands, that is, unwashed. Verse 3, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe outwardly, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. And so the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but they eat their bread with impure or unwashed hands? And Jesus said, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, you hypocrites. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching doctrines the teaching as doctrines, the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. In other words, this is a fearful thing. Sometimes even in worship, we hold to tradition rather than truth. And God says, you ignore truth. You have just dropped a bomb on your worship. It's an absolute vanity. You see, there's so much to consider. This is such a privilege of what we do now as we worship the Lord. But at the same time, it needs to be considered very carefully. Yes, you can do it because of Christ. And by the way, I don't want you to think that you're the ones that make your worship effective. Don't misunderstand those passages. Jesus alone is the one that makes our worship effective and receivable, if you will, by the Lord. But at the same time, don't be so careless and flippant with what's going on in your life when you draw near to God. How horrible, and this is what keeps me from raising my hands, how horrible would it be for you to stand here like this and know every word of every song, and at the same time, your life is an absolute train wreck. You know it, and you're too lazy to do anything about it. I would be afraid that you'd wind up like Uzzah because that's the fear that fills my own heart. Lord, you should have just dropped me right there. You would have been just. We need to consider these things. The last thing, and it's absolutely silly. It's so easy to see in the life of someone else. Run with me to 1 Samuel 15, and then we're finished. You know, there's other things that I'm skipping, but we'll, we'll come back to it some other day. 1 Samuel chapter 15. 
As soon as you see the subtitle, you're going to know where I'm going to go. It's Saul's disobedience, the king that the people chose and not the Lord. And he really wanted to worship God. And when he worshiped God, he really wanted to be seen. So if you'll notice 1 Samuel chapter 15, uh, let me begin, I guess, in verse 13. Samuel, the prophet, God's man, came to Saul and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord, said Saul, right? But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? In other words, God had told him, I want you to kill every living thing. But Saul kept for himself some of the best stuff. It's like, I can't kill a black Angus cow. I mean, I want to take him home. And I can't kill a big old fat woolly sheep. I got to take it home. So he broke the command of the Lord. But here it is when he's about to be called to account, to account by the man of God. Notice verse 15. Saul said, they have, been brought, or they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But the rest of them we utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, wait and let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And Saul said to him, speak. Samuel said, is it not true, though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of all Israel? And the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord, and I went on the mission in which the Lord sent me, and I brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, he's the king now, but the people took some of the spoil, the sheep and the ox, and the choice of the things devoted to destruction to sacrifice to the Lord God at Gilgal. And here we go. Samuel said, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than that of the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination is inequity and idolatry. Iniquity, I'm sorry, and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also rejected you from being king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have indeed transgressed or violated the command of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and listened to their voice. Now, therefore, notice, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go, Saul seized or grabbed to hold the edge of his robe and it tore. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man and that he should change his mind. Then he said, I have sinned, but please honor me. Notice this. Please honor me now before the elders of my people and before all Israel and go back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. That's all Saul was or that's all Paul, that's all Saul considered useful or profitable for himself. That was the only thing he saw as significant. I just want to be recognized among the people. Would you go back with me? And stand beside me so that when I worship the Lord, everybody will see me. See, we can look at that and go, that's sad. But I wonder how many times we worship the Lord without thought of our own disobedience and our own rebellion and our own sin. Why would we go ahead and lift the hands? Why would we say all the words? Well, let me tell you why. In order that you might be seen. And the reason I know you do that is because I've done that. And that's nowhere any of us want to be. Let's pray.